Well, as you all know from having watched my last video, this video will continue my series on Silent Hill 2, in which I review Silent Hill 2 by reviewing other games. In our first installment, I reviewed Silent Hill 2 by reviewing Nights into Dreams, and in this one, I'm going to be reviewing Silent Hill 2 by reviewing Astrobot. Just kidding. That would be insane. Besides, the next video in my Silent Hill 2 series is going to be reviewing Silent Hill 2 by reviewing Sega Bass Fishing. For now, this is just going to be a review of Astrobot, which has become an out of left field runaway critical success, already hailed as one of the best games of the year, a serious game of the year contender, and even one of the greatest platformers ever made. People are comparing it to Mario, something so crazy it makes my Silent Hill 2 series seem sane. So, is it true? Is Astrobot the new PlayStation mascot? Is Astrobot as good as Mario? I have a few thoughts about that, but if you're just looking for a simple yes or no, I suggest you skip to the timestamp I'll put on the screen now. For those who'd like to come along for the ride as we make our way to a conclusion, let's get started. As I discussed in my controversial Final Fantasy VII Rebirth video, Sony's origin story is inseparable from its David and Goliath struggle with Nintendo. The Sony PlayStation itself was created as a defiant gesture by Sony's leadership. Although the company had initially planned to create a CD-based console for Nintendo, negotiations between them fell apart and Nintendo, used to calling the shots, proved a difficult partner and decided to pursue prototypes for a CD-based system with Philips instead. Sony got its revenge in success, creating the PlayStation for itself and differentiating its brand from Nintendo's by leaning into everything Nintendo wasn't. If Nintendo was for babies, PlayStation was for adults. This proved a winning strategy because PlayStation caught the attention of actual adults as well as all the kids who want it to be adults, which is almost all kids. At any rate, PlayStation won that round of the console wars because it was cool, not some toy for babies. So fast forward to the present day and we have people clamoring, declaring that PlayStation has finally found its mascot. But how could PlayStation, the adult console, how could PlayStation have as its mascot a chibi-looking, high-pitched sounding, cheery little robot buddy? Well, actually, it makes perfect sense. Astrobot is sweet and cuddly, sure, but he can also only do two things. Jump and punch. And he doesn't just punch enemies. He can punch anything and anyone and does. He punches friends, animals, objects. Punching is his way of interacting with the world he loves. A world that also seems to love him. And the thing is, the people or animals he punches don't really seem to mind. The punch here is like a ribbing, a tap on the shoulder, a punch buggy punch, a nookie. Here's what it means that Astrobot loves to punch and that the world he punches doesn't seem to mind. It means, first of all, that Astrobot the game isn't the sentimentalized idea of, quote, something for kids, which makes Astrobot the figure still consistent with that original PlayStation ethos. And second, it's a way for Astrobot to channel the sense of hostility that's essential to playfulness. The fact of the matter is that any game you can think of is built on playful hostility. In football, guys crash into each other, take each other down. In chess, pawns are taken, queens are killed. Even in something like Foursquare, you hit a ball, you try to get the other kids out. The thing that thrills kids about play, the thing about it that connects with them on a primal level, is that it lets them explore their own curiosities, and it lets them know that to feel aggressive, to want to win, to want the other player to lose, to feel that way is okay. There's even parts of feeling that way that are fun. So the punches are the first thing that makes Astrobot make sense as the PlayStation mascot. The other thing that makes him the perfect PlayStation mascot is his lack of identity. Now, that may sound counterintuitive. Shouldn't a mascot have a firm, solid identity? Isn't that what makes Mario and Sonic so valuable to Nintendo and Sega, their recognizability? Mario goes, wahoo. Sonic goes, gotta go fast. Astrobot doesn't really say anything, although his theme song is catchy. From the beginning, PlayStation prided itself not just on the maturity of its games, but on the sheer diversity of its library. You could find almost any kind of game in its library, an advantage that was due in part to the higher power of the console when compared to Nintendo and Sega. PlayStation would be able to run a game like Final Fantasy VII, when Nintendo and Sega simply couldn't. 
And this advantage, this huge library, it's also due to the fact that CDs are cheaper to produce than cartridges. Because of that, PlayStation has any number of iconic characters. Maybe not as iconic on their own as Sonic or Mario, but they have Jack and Daxter, Ellie and Joel, Kratos, Solid Snake, Nathan Drake, the kid from Boku no Natsu Yasumi. The main character from Journey, they have Eco, for God's sake, the famous character Eco. What makes Astro Bot the perfect mascot for PlayStation is this. He can inhabit all of these characters. He's a blank canvas onto which we can draw our own personal favorite character. We can each have our own private mascot for the system, and each one can be represented by Astrobot. In this way, Astrobot, though he doesn't have much of an identity of his own, is still a conduit for feeling closer to the brand, closer to the history of the PlayStation consoles that gave us our childhood. And the fact that Astrobot lives in a universe where he and his friends literally pilot PlayStation consoles, journeying across galaxies of stories all experienced through the very same thing we're using as players, Astrobot hops onto a literal PlayStation 5 controller to enter and exit levels. All of that only strengthens that sense of identification the player has with Astrobot. By that, I mean, when we play any of the PlayStation games we love, we're like Astrobot, briefly taking on the mantle, the facade, of a given character. That makes Astrobot a very cool kind of meta mascot, to me at least, and perfectly suited to showcasing PlayStation's diverse library of games in all its decentralized splendor. So we know that Astrobot is the perfect mascot for the PlayStation because he punches things, and because he can be any character. But is Astrobot the game, the first full-fledged outing for Astrobot the character, as good a platformer as any given Mario game? Alright, well, it's as good as Super Mario Sunshine. A game that comes to mind in part because of the fantastic button mini-levels, X, square, triangle, and circle which are super abstract single-shot levels that bear a huge resemblance to those abstract levels in Super Mario Sunshine where they sing the theme song a cappella. Those were my favorite levels in Sunshine. Moreover, there's obviously a bit of a Mario Galaxy overtone in terms of the journeying to different planets and an effort to strengthen the main starship. And there are certain power-ups that feel similar to stuff in Galaxy games, and there are aspects of the collectathon that are kind of like Mario Odyssey. Just like some moons are no-brainers and some are fantastic, some of the rescued bots here are a little uninspired, though the vast majority are a lot of fun. Here's my one actual complaint about Astrobot, by the way. I don't think there should have been any normal bots. I think they all should have been PlayStation characters of one kind or another. There are so many PlayStation characters to choose from, and it would have been cool to see them go even more niche. Maybe for the sequel. So, it's as good as Super Mario Sunshine, which is pretty great. But to me, the amazing thing is that this is a whole new major platform of which we can take notice, standing outside comparisons. And it comes from a team that couldn't deserve it more. I hope this success inspires Sony to reinvest in these more deliberately crafted, shorter, outside-the-box games. And I hope Team Asobi can rest easy knowing that they've brought fresh air into a year that's recently seen Sony plagued by disastrous aesthetic decisions leading to disastrous financial outcomes, like uh, Concord. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Thanks for watching, thank you. And now I'm just going to end with a, a troll for people who just skipped ahead to hear a simple yes or no verdict. You guys, the real ones, the ones who watched everything, you guys can stop watching now. Thank you for watching. <clears throat> I now give you my simple verdict on Astrobot and the idea of whether it's as good as Mario and whether Astrobot can serve as a mascot for Sony. And in giving you this simple verdict, I will simply have to quote the great psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott. <clears throat> Love and hate form the two chief elements out of which human affairs are built. Both love and hate involve aggression, and one must remember that aggression may be a symptom of fear. I start with an assumption, one which I am aware is not considered by everyone to be justified, that whatever good and evil is to be found in the world of human relationships is to be found in the heart of the human individual. I start with an assumption. One which I am aware is not considered by everyone to be justified, that whatever good and evil is to be found in the world of human relationships is to be found in the heart 
of the individual human being, I carry the assumption further and say that in Astrobot, there is love and hate of full human intensity. If one can think in terms of what Astrobot is organized to withstand, one can easily arrive at the conclusion that love and hate are not experienced more violently by the adult than by Astrobot. If all this is accepted, it should follow that we have only to look at the adult human being or at the little child or at Astrobot to see the love and hate that are there. But if the problem were as simple as that, there would be no problem. Of all human tendencies, aggression in particular is hidden, disguised, sidetracked, ascribed to outside agencies, and when it appears, it is always a difficult task to trace its origins. So, as we conclude our review of Astrobot, we must of course be prepared to find we can never see naked the hate that nevertheless we know exists in the human bosom. Even Astrobot himself, who wants you to know he likes knocking over bricks, only lets you know this because there exists at the moment a general atmosphere of building a tower with the bricks within which he can be destructive without feeling hopeless. Well, I can't put it any more simply than that, and I hope you'll forgive me for being blunt. There you have it, folks. Thanks for watching.